So good morning. My name is um, Steve Brower, and I am an English uh, professor. I'm an associate professor of English at St. John Fisher College, which is up in Rochester, New York. Uh, I teach courses in uh, American literature and American studies. And I would identify myself as a cultural historian. Um, and one of the things I'm most interested in studying uh, are crime narratives and uh, notions of criminality as they have evolved, especially over the last 130 years or so. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that today and the, um, the notion, uh, the idea of the criminal type, um, but talking about it from a, from a particular perspective. So, um, so the title of my talk, as you can see, is The Criminal Type in Popular Culture, a Case Study. And by the way, because I'm an English professor, I, I, I write papers, so I'm going to be reading some, but I'll, I'll try to make it compelling. Um, so I'd like to begin by showing you an image. This image is a photograph made by the German photographer August Sander. It's dated 1926 to 1930, and it is entitled Criminal Type. This image is from a series of photographs collected in a, portfo a portfolio now housed at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, titled Types and Figures of the City, all of which derive from Sanders' ambitious collection of portraits that he took in the 1920s, 30s, and early 40s, called People of the 20th Century. Now, Sanders was a German photographer seeking to document the German people of his time, and he sought to do so by making photographs of people from different backgrounds and different classes by using the same techniques and same backgrounds, thereby erasing social divisions. Right? By, if we create common ways of photographing them, um, we do not demarcate them in that way. So, but some figures were identified by name, some by profession. Few were identified in the way this first image is, by type. So I'd like you to show you some other images. This image uh, photograph is called Typesetter. This photograph is called Casual Laborer. Each of these three images is of a man set centered within the frame. What do we know of these men? Very little. The first image is closely cropped with an obscure background with the second two in more specific, if vague, settings. What can we tell about these men? Who they are? What they believed? What they were like? I would argue that Sanders seeks to suggest that these men are not that inherently different, and that the photographs, when taken together, suggest a sort of commonality, which was, again, part of his project. However, I would also point out that in his titles for the photographs, Sanders undermines his very project by giving one man a very specific occupation, typesetter, another man a less specific occupation, but still something of one, as a casual laborer is someone who is employed on a temporary rather than a full-time basis. But if we return to the first image, we find that Sander identifies this man not by occupation or by name, but by something else, a criminal type. This, I would argue, sets this figure up as something entirely different than the others. What in this image identifies this man as a criminal? What denotes his criminality? Without telling us what it is that makes this man a criminal type, Sanders shows us an image of one, and so doing, actually places him in a distinct and separate category than others in his series. We don't know what he has done or why he is identified in this way. The photograph by itself provides no such data. But we do know that he is different. He is called something different. And we know that he poses a, uh, poses a danger because he's identified as a criminal. So it's this very gesture, the labeling of someone as a criminal type, that I'd like to explore this morning in its logic and in its devastating consequences. To do so, I first uh, I, I want to turn to a particular moment in American popular culture. This is not an image that purports to be a criminal type. This is the image of a detective, Dick Tracy, in fact. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the comic strip Dick, Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy was first published during Prohibition in 1931, originally in the Detroit Daily Mirror and then a week later in the New York Daily News, which had a readership of over two million people. It was distributed through the Chicago Tribune Company syndicate. By the end of the 1930s, Dick Tracy was a phenomenal success 
appearing in 160 newspapers around the country, and by the middle of the 1940s, its estimated readership was 27 million. During the 1920s and early 1930s, um, the person who created it, Chester Gould, had worked without much success as a comic strip artist in Chicago. In his work with reporters, he witnessed the unsettling and influential presence of gangsters in the city, and he came to despise the role they played in contemporary urban America. That would be the case if you were in Chicago at the time. <laughs> he decided to create a strip focused on a character dedicated to dealing with the crime problem. Although the strip focused on the crime-fighting efforts of its title character, Dick Tracy, um, the most compelling characters were usually the villains, most of whom in the first five to ten years were patterned after actual and highly public criminals. The first villain, Big Boy, appeared in 1931 and was patterned after Al Capone, a well-dressed, fat, balding man with gold teeth and an ever-present cigar. On April 12, 1932, in the installment of a series called The Buddy Waldorf Snatching, which mirrored the real-life kidnap, real-life Lindbergh kidnapping, Chief Brandy proclaims, Tracy, this country is in the grip of a plague worse than war. Gangsters are striking at the foundation of America, the home. Gould, right, you have to do it with that voice of a sort of, Gould, I, don't, I don't think I did that very well, but I'll, I'll try harder. Gould's construction of the comic strip narrative addresses public anxiety about the invasion of crime into the home, a space that had once been a sanctuary. The Lindbergh cap kidnapping dominated media coverage in the spring of 1932, and was widely discussed and theorized in public and private settings across the country and in all different social levels. It was, as the cliché goes, the crime of the century. In the April 12th installment of Gould Strip, published just two days after the Lindbeck Lindbergh kidnapping, Big Boy kidnaps the young Waldorf child. And in instituting this series, Gould co-ops the narrative of the internationally covered story of the, of the Lindbergh case, at least in the funny pages. Later that spring, in an installment published nine days after authorities discovered the corpse of the Lindbergh baby, Dick Tracy captures and physically beats Big Boy, the man who had snatched Buddy Waldorf from his parents. Although the Lindbergh baby died, Buddy Waldorf did not. In his comic strip, if not in real life, Gould could construct a means through which good could prevail and he could reestablish normalcy. The strip could act, therefore, as a means to address and allay anxieties about the impact of crime on law-abiding citizens through fictionalized representations of real-life narratives. We can save the baby in the strip, even if not in real life, and in so doing, we can perhaps allay some anxieties of parents and families in the public. And again, this is with a, a wide readership. With the passing of prohibition, crime rates did not immediately drop. In 1934, there were 1,354 cases of criminal homicide in New York alone for that single year. Following Al Capone's imprisonment, Tracy continued to fight gangsters who were now based on such headline-garnering figures as Pretty Boy Floyd, Clyde Barrow, John Dillinger, and others. All of them were defeated by Tracy. In the late 1930s, though, Gould began to populate his strip with flamboyant characters with abnormal features and physiques who were commonly known as the grotesques. Characters fully of his own imagination no longer based on actual criminals. Drawn with bulging, scarred foreheads, or the eyes, nose, and teeth of a mole, or with tiny fissures or deep wrinkles spread over their entire face, the grotesques interacted each day with other characters who were drawn with regularly proportioned bodies and features. And this is the mole on the right. The grotesques served a different function in the strip than Big Boy and the previous villains had. Instead of representing crises within the city during Prohibition in the following years, the grotesques instead personified crime itself. Gould's drawing of them makes quite clear that these characters are distinct from the other ones in the strip. The grotesques were the villains, and their abnormalities represented a tangible manifestation of their abject moral status. The most famous of the grotesques were the brow, prune face, and flat top. The brow. He was drawn as something of a common street thug with a, a bald head, a strong nose that was perhaps once broken, a sharp and pointy jaw. But what set this character apart with the deep and hairy, uh, heavy furrows of skin making up his forehead that essentially alighted the space between the top of his head and his eyes? The most prominent feature of flat top was the shape of his head, which of course was perfectly flat on top, accentuated even further by the middle part in his dark hair. Prune face was especially hideous, with long and deep wrinkles running vertically down his face, mainly from his cheekbones on down. His eyes and nose were like, likewise quite 
um, find in his puckered mouth was virtually swallowed by the map line of wrinkles. So in speaking about the grotesque, and here I'm going to quote from Chester Gould himself in an interview, he wrote, or he said, I wanted my villains to stand out definitely so that there would be no mistake who the villain was. So I want to take a moment to be sure you can just hear how stunning this sentence is. I wanted my villains to stand out definitely so that there would be no mistake who the villain was. They were drawn in a particular way that identified them as different. The other characters were more regularly drawn. This statement implies that the reader needed physical markings to tell bad from good, as opposed to following the plot line to determine who the bad guy was. Right? <coughs> Gould's anxiety here is the plot line won't be enough. We know that the drawings are meant to connote criminality, even though neither the action nor the dialogue in the strip ever explicitly allude to the physical reality of the grotesque. No one ever says to Pruneface, what's going on there? Right? They just interact with them. Um, their misshapen physical attributes isolate them from the other characters, and we therefore can readily identify them as the ones who will commit the robbery, the kidnapping, the murder. But essentially, in Gould's imagination, the reader knows the bad guy in the strip not because of the action, but because he has an abnormal face or body that functions as an emblem of criminality. His use of the grotesque was a very simple ploy to differentiate the morally deviant from the morally good, represented by square-jawed Dick Tracy. By overemphasizing the physical defects of these characters, Gould alerted the readers that they should be recognized immediately as villains. He wanted there to be, as he put it, no mistake who the criminal was, and he therefore drew a particular body in order to signal a threat to his readers. So while not realistically drawn, the grotesque represented a powerful manifestation of very real anxieties about criminality at the time. And in literalizing those anxieties in his drafting style, Gould's method of drawing the grotesque relied upon a logic that there was a quantifiable criminal type that one could recognize. By constructing such a manifest difference between the villains and the other characters, Gould suggested that morality could be represented physically. Okay? That morality could be represented on the body. Building on the scholarship of historians such as Alan Sekula, Nicole Han Rafter, and Sean Michelle Smith, I would suggest that the idea that this con I would suggest the idea that this concept has a deep and shameful history that linked immorality and crime with racial and ethnic others. Because recognizing the grotesque was so straightforward, it was not difficult for readers to decode the figurative meaning of the characters who were drawn as literally disfigured. With the stroke of a pen, Gould quantified the criminal threat for his readers and identified those readers who appeared different as the face of crime, the members of society to fear as threats to public safety and security. These threats in this logic were those individuals whose appearance was, in whole or even in part, ethnically or racially determined. And so I'm going to pause here. Um, as I mentioned, I, I'm an I'm a English American studies professor, cultural historian. Uh, I'm, I'm quite possibly the sole humanist uh, in the room. Um, and I'm surrounded by criminologists and social scientists and people who like, work in law enforcement and the justice system. Um, I'm not sure how far, when I was writing this, I'm like, how far do I need to go to explain what the criminal type is? So I'm going to have a, I assume that, that most people here have a, have a strong sense of its theory, its history. But I, I will say a little bit. So, so suffice it to say that Cesar Lombroso and his, quote unquote, his followers used social science methods to collect physical data on prison inmates. And in cataloging this information, the data, they noted, they noted not only physical measurements, but also the crimes that the inmates had committed right, about each person. This information served as an archive of criminals and had, uh, as such, had terrific implications in identifying criminals from victim testimonies and eyewitness descriptions. Um, along with Galton's work on fingerprints, Lombroso's data collection served a valuable tool for criminal investigators. Right? Now we can, once we have, we, we've got suspects, let's see their fingerprints. Well, we've got this physical description of the, uh, from eyewitnesses. We have this record of, of um, you know, when they go on Law and Order and they're looking through the book to see, does this match the photo? We have that ability to do that. That comes from Lombroso and from Galton. However, perhaps of course, it was not only used for that purpose, as can happen, this data was misunderstood and it was misused. Although the measurements served as correlative data about individuals, the social scientists at the time, operating out of a belief that there exists a criminal type, treated the physical measurements as something closer to causative data, thereby linking criminality to particular physical features. Moreover, 
This data was treated as a type of index so that researchers could, in fact, cross-reference physical features with particular crimes. To further the misuse of the data, researchers, researchers not only treated this as an index of criminality, but they also imagined it as a potential predictor of criminality. In their work emerged a certain body, or from their work emerged a certain body, that could be read as a criminal body, even a priori actual criminal behavior. So I just want to pause, right? Based on what they had collected, they not only said, okay, this type of body commits this type of crime. They also said, and once we see that body, we can predict that crime. Okay? So a priori, even before criminal behavior, they're suggesting I can recognize the danger based on what they look like. It will not surprise anyone to hear that the criminal body was readily identified as an abnormal body and one that associated criminality with particular racial, ethnic, and even working class types. The very men who were doing the cataloging and indexing were seeking to support through their work contemporary theories that linked biological race with levels of, intellect <coughs> excuse me, levels of intellectual and cultural development. Okay. The theory of the criminal type in the work of Lombroso certainly had some influence in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as it came into vogue in academic circles. Advanced through a number of academic treatises and studies by such men as Arthur MacDonald, Henry Boys, C.R. Henderson, August Stroms, and others. Although most social science scholars and academics had dismissed the concept as valuable and or unscientific by the 1920s, the concept had found purchase within the greater American public. The persistence of the concept on how the public conceived of criminality was due in large part because it theorized that criminality could be predicted and identified in advance of the actual crime, a theory incredibly appealing and a culture rife with anxiety about criminals and criminality. It is, when this, it is within this context that we can recognize the logic of Gould's desire to demarcate the criminals in his storylines with the distinctly drawn body that distinguished their bodies from those of other law-abiding men and women. The possibility of predicting the threat, of knowing where to look and who to be wary of, is easy to imagine as comforting and deeply appealing. This is just a very quick Google engram of criminal type. Okay, and as you'll see, it really starts emerging a little bit, 1840, 1880, then boom, shoots up with Lombroso, right around here. Shoots all the way up through its height, right around uh, 1918, with the Red Scare, which I'll be mentioning, and then it starts to come down, but it still persists. So this theory, that immorality, that criminality, an internal notion, is etched onto our physical bodies continues to operate in our culture. That's what I really want to think about. That's what I'm suggesting Gould operates out of when he's drawing the grotesques. But it's not just Gould. Can I ask a question? How was the persistence percentage quantified? I, 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 uh, based on how it shows up in Google Books. Okay. I know that. Right? So this comes from, uh, now, you know, Google is digitizing as many books as it can. So this, it shows up in um, whatever book is published. So like surveys of the general population as to what they think of the Surveys, it might be treatises, it might be, it can be any book. Google doesn't distinguish that way in, in this sort of thing. So the persistence of the theory in American culture is something we should consider, not only because it reveals something about American anxiety about crime and criminality, but because the logic of the criminal type had and continues to have consequences. And the consequences are the most severe for those who are identified as fitting the criminal type who have the, or who have the criminalized body. So let, let's begin with the Red Scare of 1919-1920. In 1920, following months of raids, arrests, and deportations of immigrants, linked, however tenuously, to the May Day bombings of 1919, or to uprisings against the government, Attorney General testified in front of Congress about the men who he identified as alien radicals. And he said, out of the sly and crafty eyes of many of them leap cupidity, cruelty, insanity, and crime. From their lopsided faces, sloping brows, and misshapen features may be recognized the unmistakable criminal type. I'm going to suggest that this statement clearly demonstrates the way he perceives particular physical features with criminality and with danger. 
and reveals his foundational logic that suggests that the identification and arrest of individuals with these features in advance of any criminal activity is fully justifiable. This testimony comes after the Palmer raids in the fall of 1919 all the way through the early winter of 1920. The House started to investigate what went on with the Palmer raids. Um, those people had not committed crimes, but they were uh, raided, arrested, deported without any due process. This is a logic that the Attorney General articulates for why that's fully justified. Okay. I'm going to suggest we can locate that same type of logic at play 20 years later during World War II when the U.S. government decided to incarcerate Japanese and Japanese Americans. The term then was interned without any due process at all. The rhetoric of the United States government was such that these men, women, and children were enemies or potential enemies merely by nature of their ancestry. That rhetoric was matched by many in the public, most notably the Los Angeles Times. Here's what they wrote in February 1942. A viper is nonetheless a viper wherever the egg is hatched. So a Japanese American born of Japanese parents, nurtured upon Japanese traditions, living in a translated Japanese atmosphere, notwithstanding his nominal brand of accidental citizenship, almost inevitably, and with the rarest exceptions, grows up to be a Japanese and not an American. Thus, while it may cause injustice to a few to treat them all as potential enemies, I cannot escape the conclusion that such treatment should be accorded to each and all of them while we are at war with their race. In April 22, 1943, as a race, the Japanese have made for themselves a record of conscience, conscienceless treachery, unsurpassed in history. Whatever small theoretical advantages there might be in releasing those under restraint in this country would be enormously outweighed by the risks involved. Sixty years later, post 9-11, Middle Eastern men and women suffered a great deal of backlash from American citizens following the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Whether or not these men or women were Islamic, whether or not they were actually United States citizens. And here we have an image of a man at a type of rally. All I need to know about Islam I learned on 9-11. And we, here we have what we might identify as an editorial cartoon. It's time to it's time for all Americans to unite under the flag in the first panel. In the second panel, says to the woman identified as Muslim Americans, except you. I'm going to suggest that these operate under a logic that is still linked to the theory of the criminal type. These are examples that are well known and are part of a logic that takes hold during times of national crises and subsequent anxiety and a logic that attaches itself to broad swaths of people identified as potential threats. But of course, that logic can apply to individuals as well. Perhaps the most famous moment of this came after O.J. Simpson was arrested and his mugshot became widely seen. There's his mugshot. Newsweek and Time magazines both published that mugshot on the cover, but while Newsweek published the direct image, Time published what it had to later admit, it did not admit at first, was an artist's interpretation of the mugshot in which the artist darkened Simpson's skin and made the background both darker and more abstract. It's perhaps not hard to see exactly how that artist was interpreting the mugshot. Simpson as the embodiment of public danger, black men as the embodiment of public danger, the black body is inherently dangerous in a sight of anxiety and fear. The logic of this image, I would argue, is at the heart of the justifications for racial profiling as a policing strategy. The criminalized body, racialized and ethnicized as it's been for over a century, is ultimately a form of social control. And it depends on a logic that leads to severe consequences for individuals over and over again in our contemporary moment. And then I would like to finish with one um, story. I'm going to go back to a similar type of profiling, though, from about 100 years ago. And I want to consider the case of Nic Nicolas Sacco and Bartolome Bartol uh, Bartolomeo Vanzetti. So in the spring of 1920, authorities in Massachusetts arrested these two Italian immigrants for the robbery and murder of two men who were delivering the payroll of a shoe factory. In his opening statement at the trial, prosecuting attorney Williams said of the two killers, based on eyewitness reports, quote, they were two short men, perhaps five feet, six or seven, rather stocky, described as perhaps 140 and 160 in the vicinity, caps, dark clothes, of apparent Italian lineage. That last phrase, of apparent Italian lineage, stands out as the only moment in this detailed description that is uncertain. The height, weight, clothes are determined to specific dimensions as would be appropriate to descriptions sought by police investigating any crime. 
But by assigning an apparent ethnicity to the murders as well, the prosecutors sought to capitalize on public anxieties concerning immigrants and radicals, especially from Italy. He later described how an eyewitness noticed an Italian with a mustache. In each of these instances in his opening statement, the prosecuting attorney did not specify skin tone or anything else that might specifically signal the killer's ethnicity. He simply identified them as an ethnic type, suggesting to the jury that ethnicity itself is what lay at the heart of the identification of the men on trial. This effort on the part of prosecution to emphasize ethnicity to the jury was further borne out in the identification stage of the trial, during which a number of witnesses who offered identifications of the killers gave questionable descriptions. When one witness, John Faulkner, was asked by the prosecution, what kind of looking man was he? Faulkner answered, why, he looked like a foreigner with a black mustache and cheekbones. Another mess, uh, witness, Harry Dolbear, likewise said in testimony about the same man, quote, he looked like a foreigner and he had very heavy mustache, quite dark. A heavy, dark mustache and cheekbones. Are these the identifying mark of foreigners and only of foreigners? I don't know what my cheekbones are like. Um, <laughs> clearly not. Dobear also testified that all of the men involved, quote, appeared strange to me, as strangers to the town, a carload of foreigners. That carload was a tough-looking bunch. Asked to describe the men in the car in terms of their looks or even the clothes they were wearing, however, Dobear was unable to offer anything whatsoever in terms of a description. The repeated emphasis on the appearance of the killer, killers as foreigners is striking in its lack of specificity. What makes them foreign? Dolbear's testimony moves swiftly, rhetorically speaking, from strangers to foreigners to criminals, treating all three as equivalent. Furthermore, the prosecuting attorneys in their cross-examination of defense witnesses, who claimed that defendants were not the killers, continually tried to stress ethnicity as a determining factor of identification and to downplay or contradict any attempts the witnesses made to assert their interpretation of skin complexion. A number of witnesses all testified that the criminal had a light complexion. In a noteworthy exchange between Frentello and District Attorney Katzman, the, uh, the attorney sidestepped the issue of complexion and said insisted on bringing in the issue of nationality, claiming that the witness had previously stated to a police officer that one of the killers had been Italian, without being able to say, what made him Italian to your eyes? How could you tell by looking if you can't give a description? Casper made no effort to combat the way in which the defendant had described the skin complexion. Instead, he sought to problematize the more concrete means of identification by raising ethnicity for the jury. So the criminal, I would argue, the criminalization of the ethno-racial body that was apparent in the work of Lombroso, the words of Attorney General Palmer, had real-life consequences in the trial of Sacco Vanzetti. The witness descriptions were crucial to the conviction of the defendants, but those descriptions demonstrated bias against radicals and ethnic Italians. Perhaps stunningly, in his written opinion determining his verdict, issued in 1924, the presiding judge declared that the guilty verdict rendered by the jury in the trial had less to do with eyewitness testimony than with the consciousness of guilt. Consci Sorry. Sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt. Uh, there are a couple of cars parked in the construction area. They need to be moved immediately. So it's uh, plate 6 zf 7644 and DFR 1279. Looks like we're okay. <laughs> no problem. So the judge said, I, I'm going to declare guilty, but I'm really going to do it what happened to the consciousness of guilt when they were arrested. At the time of the arrest, they were each armed, and the police claimed that they made movements to use their guns. They also lied and misled the police about their beliefs, about their radical beliefs, when they were first questioned. They claimed, though, during the trial, that these actions were the result of their fears about deportation or abuse by authorities, which is certainly what was going on at the time, in 1920. One of their best friends had recently and inexplicably died while under arrest for his radical beliefs in New York. Sacco and Vanzetti feared a similar fate. I would suggest the behavior of the two men at their arrest, which Judge Thayer identifies as their consciousness of guilt, could certainly have derived from the fact both of the defendants were immigrants and radicals who feared, at that moment in time, serious institutional repercussions as a result of their ideological beliefs. Their actions, though, were used to suggest their guilt and illuminate why the prosecution emphasized their ethnicity to such a degree. Right. So I'm suggesting, might there be a reasonable doubt about their consciousness of guilt? Probably. They weren't particularly interested in that. 
Their history of immigration to America in the first decade of the century, when considered with their admitted radicalism, created an easy narrative for the jury to digest about the defendants as individuals who rejected an American way of life and who sought to threaten it. Even the judge believed they were guilty, as much as for their beliefs as for the evidence that they actually committed the crimes. In an appeal for clemency, the defendants offered affidavits asserting the judge's predisposition against radicals, his repeated statements in private to friends and colleagues uh, during and after the trial against Sacco and Vanzetti based on their ideological possessions. But as we know, that appeal was rejected and they were executed on August 23, 1927. Here's Nicolo Sacco. Is this the face of crime? Is this the criminal type? What would make him so? Here's Sanders' photo of criminal type. I come back to it again because I want to emphasize again just how the photo itself does not offer any data about what makes this figure a criminal type. Why does this man fit this description? Why not this other man? The photograph, of course, does not say. Instead, it merely tells us that this man is identified as a typesetter. typesetter. But when I look at Nicola Sacco, do I really see someone who looks so different than the typesetter? I wonder. To me, it's the identif identification of these figures that seems to define them for public consumption. That this man is employed. This man is given a name. But this man is denied both of these and identified only and merely as a criminal. Even though evidence of the crime is nowhere to be found in the image. That is a mindset and a process that is still very present in our contemporary culture and I believe something we must be vigilant about fighting against. Thank you.